Good morning, fellow lovers of wisdom. It is an honor to be here as your MC today because uh, we will listen to some of the few intellectual elites and scholars, the top 10% of people in this country, to talk about not to justify whether there is indeed a Filipino philosophy or not, but to render a commemorative lecture on the men and women who contributed great ideas in philosophy in this country. Only the very best people in this field will take the time and make the sacrifice to come so far for a conference like this. Imagine a world without a genius mind. That's not possible. But a world without philosophy, that's not possible. In the spirit of the worldwide celebration of philosophy day to day, teachers and philosophers throughout different topographies are gathered to listen and participate in this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, to listen to those who exceeded their reputation beyond the university walls and contribute to the honing of philosophical ideas. Yeah, and hello again, everyone. Welcome back and welcome to Panel 4, our last panel for today's webinar with the theme, The Groundwork of Filipino Philosophy. Now to share and discuss to us about the life, work, and thoughts of several Filipino philosophers, we have here Dr. Preciosa de Hoya, Dr. Kerwin Mahagway, and Dr. Rodrigo Abenes. Our first speaker, Dr. Preciosa de Hoya, is an assistant professor at the Philosophy Department in Ateneo de Manila. In 2014, she finished her doctoral studies in Southeast Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore under the supervision of Professor Reynaldo Ileto. And from 2014 to 2016, she was a doctoral fellow at the Inst Institute for Cultural Inquiry in Berlin. Her dissertation entitled In Search of Filipino Philosophy, and subsequent publications are explorations of the intellectual landscape in the Philippines, specifically an analysis of both texts and contexts of ideas, traditions, and debates that spurred and or stunted contestation and localization in the field of philosophy. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Preciosa de Hoya. Ang ating susunod na tagapagsalita ay si Dr. Derwin Mahagway. Si Dr. Mahagway ay guro ng pilosopiya sa graduado at di graduadong antas sa University of Rizal System, Pililia. Siya rin ang punong patnugot ng The URSP Research Journal ng nasabing pamantasan. Samantalang nagtapos siya ng doktor ng pilosopiya sa pilosopiya sa pamantasang De La Salle, Manila, kung saan isinulat niya ang pilosopiya ng edukasyon ni Emerita S. Quito sa kanyang disertasyon sa ilalim ng CHED Scholarship. Ang nasabi ring disertasyon ay tumanggap ng Gawad La Salle, Lasalyano sa Filipino sa parehong pamantasan. Ang kanyang mga sulatin at pananaliksik ay nakatuon sa pilosopiya ng edukasyon, pilosopiyang Filipino at mga usapin sa Silangang Mindoro. Everyone, let us welcome Dr. Jerwin Mahagway. For our last speaker, we have Dr. Rodrigo D. Abenes. Dr. Abenes is the current Dean for Academics and Technology and Livelihood Education of the Philippine Normal University, South Luzon. Prior to his appointment to PNUSL TL TLE Hub, he served as a full-time faculty of the College of Graduate Studies in Teacher Education Research of the Philippine Normal University main campus. He is also a lecturer of philosophy at the Ateneo de Manila University. His research interests are philosophy of education, sociopolitical philosophy, culture and heritage, and Filipino philosophy. 
He is also the current PRO of the Philippine National Philosophical Research Society. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Abenes and all of our speakers with a round of applause. Okay, so with that, may I welcome now our first speaker, Dr. Preciosa De Hoya. Ma'am, you may take the floor. Hello, Ma'am Gov. Thank you for introducing me. Let me just share my uh, the PowerPoint presentation that I uh, prepared. Just a minute. Can you see it? All right. Okay. Well, um, first of all, I I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to this webinar and all of you who have taken the time to tune in. My presentation today is based on a paper that was published in Critica Cultura sometime back in 2016. So I'm really grateful for this occasion, not only to share with you part of my research, but to be able to get back to a topic that I had temporarily set aside. But I think what's important to note uh, is that this research is very much a work in progress, which I think is true for most of us here. Uh, trying through our collective effort to build an archive to understand our history, particularly how we Filipinos teach and practice philosophy. So if there are people in the audience who later would like to provide more information or a piece to the puzzle, that would be a great contribution. One of the things I realized recently was that my research on Dr. Pasquale had been quite challenging, far more than perhaps my study of Father Ferriol, who was my teacher, of, or, or Father Albert Alejo and Dr. Zeus Salazar, with whom I am constantly in touch. Pasquale, on the other hand, was for me, well, a kind of ghost from the past, and yet one who would prove to have the power of a specter, of one who keeps coming back. I wouldn't have known about Ricardo Pascual if it hadn't been for Reynaldo Eleto. In 2010, which was about the time I had started my dissertation, uh, he mentioned in an email that he had just been reading Pascual's Rizal Beyond the Grave, first published in 1935 and reprinted in 1950 with, and I quote, the obvious intent of undermining the anti-communist Catholic churches attempted co-optation of Rizal at around the time of the Hope Rebellion. But to be honest, um, but to be honest, what triggered my interest was the kind of person, uh, perceptions, sorry, I was getting about Pasquale. Uh, the way, um, sorry, the way, the way he has been depicted as a negligible father of philosophy in the state university and how um, he apparently was more interested in provoking his students, shattering their religious beliefs in writing philosophy articles or books. And yet, as I did my research, I came to discover that this so-called negligible father was in fact the guiding force for the young teachers of the philosophy department, who along with the so-called Palma boys, such as Teodoro Agoncillo, Leopoldo Yabes, Salvador Lopez, and Armando Malay, became the zealous advocates of secular liberalism in UP in the 1950s. And even today, Pascual is remembered as a great intellectual influence. Professor uh, Francisco Nemenzo, uh, for example, remembers how Pasquale taught him to be, I quote, skeptical, to disbelief, and rigorously to examine what I read or hear. Jose Maria Cizan uh, states how he matured, re remem he matured, remembering fondly how he learned much by debating with Dean Pasquale, and how he, I quote, joined his study group of professors and graduate students and enjoyed most of his debates with Pasquale 
testing and sharpening his understanding of Lenin's materialism and imperial criticism. Meanwhile, Epifanio San Juan Jr. attests that his regular encounters with Pascual, along with others like Teodoro Agoncillo, Alfredo Lagmay, Agustin Rodolfo, and Pascual Capis, helped introduce their circle of English majors to the wider world of philosophical speculation and sociocultural argumentation. Pascual, in other words, was the stuff of legend. Beyond these anecdotes, I wanted to know more who Ricardo Pascual was and why he was so important. I read some of his works, but in order to provide context, uh, sorry, that, that came a bit later. But anyway, um, so I, I read some of uh, Pascual's work, but in order to provide the context to his thought, I also looked uh, at old articles from UP student publication, the Philippine Collegian. The so-called loyalty checks was obviously, sorry, sorry, the, the I skipped a, a, a paragraph. Okay, and, and so in, in the Philippine Collegian, I, I found news clips of a congressional investigation uh, that occurred in 1961 by Congressman Leonardo Perez and his Committee on Anti-Filipino Activities, also known as CAFA. This so-called loyalty check was obviously a witch hunt against several UP professors and students who were allegedly harboring communist leanings. And one of the professors who were in, indicted then for allegedly, uh, you know, alleged for his alleged uh, affiliation with the Politburo was the professor of philosophy and dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, Ricardo Pascual. But before discussing. Um, in detail, Pascual's involvement in this controversy, uh, let me provide a bit of context. See, what triggered the CAFA inquiry was a complaint um, by former intelligence, sorry, that was too soon. Anyway, so what triggered the CAFA inquiry was a complaint by former intelligence officer, Carlos Albert who was accusing certain published articles of sedition, one of which was a 64-page uh, manuscript entitled uh, the, Peasant War in, the Peasant War in the Philippines that appeared in the 1958 Golden Jubilee issue of the university's journal, the Philippine Social Sciences and Humanities Review. Uh, what roused suspicion was that its author was kept anonymous and only the year 1946 appeared mysteriously at the bottom of the title page. Containing what was perceived as communistic jargons, Albert argued that the text posed a threat to the Republic. So the prosecutors dragged members of the journal's editorial board to court. This included editor-in-chief Thomas, Thomas Fonacher and assistant managing editor Leopoldo Yabes. In their defense, Yabes explained that they actually received the mimeographed manuscript in the mail back in 1949. But in exercising prudence and sensitivity to the social political conditions, they decided to withhold the manuscript's publication to 1958. So basically, the manuscript was already a decade old and argued that it no longer had an agenda or value except as a historical document. The prosecutors were, however, arguing that there was a resurgence of communism in 1958, which Judge Nicasio Ayacto, in dismissing all charges in 1964, deemed unsubstantial, given the sense of political stability and relative calm in the mid-1950s. One has to remember that the reason for this political stability was that the Philippine government under Ramon Magsaysay, a Secretary of Defense, had just won a decisive victory against the post-war peasant guerrilla movements of the hoops. And as Professor Hernando Abaya writes, Magsaysay was successfully large, successful largely due to the expertise and guidance of top CIA man, Colonel Edward Lance, Lansdale. Abaya further notes that while Magsaysay cleaned up the Philippine army and invested in rural projects, he remained clearly in favor of American policy which constantly, and I quote, underscored the threat of communism to Asian freedom. 
And this is why, despite the relative calm during that time, the manuscript's analysis of agrarian and social issues and its overbearing concern with American imperialism were in fact still very relevant in the 1950s. More importantly, one could see the manuscript not merely as a political economic treatise, but a specter that reappears 10 years after its supposed date of composition. But which ghost are we talking about here? Was it the specter that Marx spoke of? I think the key lies on the supposed date of the manuscript's composition, which was 1946. If we, know, if we investigate further why that year was significant, we realize that it was the year when the Hooks decided to remobilize to once again take arms, basically to defend themselves from persecution for allegedly committing crimes during the war and harboring anti-American sentiments. We have to remember that the Hooks had played a major role in liberating the Philippines from Japanese occupation and was therefore a formidable ally of the Americans, American army at that time. They were quick to disband after the war, eager to return to, to farming their lands, but because of their mass popularity and organization, several Usafe officers and political elites found them a threat to the status quo and began to brand them as bandits and communists. But I think 1946 was also historically crucial because it was the year before the Hook Balahap officially became a post-war peasant guerrilla movement and before it was officially raised in 1948 as the military arm of the Communist Party, which in the end will strongly denounce Taruk's surrender in 1954. So I argue that 1946 brings us back to a time prior to all this, to a group of peasant freedom fighters who were not fighting for an ideology, but for their own survival, who did not want to overthrow the government, but to ensure civil liberties and agrarian reform. So you see, for example, a passage in the manuscript, the very one that Fonacier and Yabes would quote to prove that it should not be seen as an apology for communism, but the voice of Filipinos fighting for their freedom. Uh, stating that many Filipinos reject communism as a way of life, but that they will be driven to it because the government fails to recognize the plight of its own people. The Filipinos, it says, is now awakened and won't simply do lip service to democracy and may be attracted to communism if the government does not revise its policies. It says, John Dules may tell us that the communist tactic is to make freedom and liberty their political fronts. It may be true, but it is a fact too that the fighter for freedom is not necessarily a communist. I am citing this passage from the manuscript basically to argue that there was an insidious attempt to use witch hunts and red scares to misrecognize every form of critique or resistance as an assault against the state and to create a pretext for both persecution and legal prosecution of these elements. Ricardo Pascual, like I said earlier, was also seen as a seditious element and was brought to trial for his alleged communist leanings. But I believe like the 1946 manuscript, Pascual was a victim of misrecognition. A few of Pascual's contemporaries, such as uh, Odi Corpus and Cesar Mahul, claimed that the accusation was completely unjust and that the philosophy professor was being tried not so much for his communist beliefs as for his agnosticism and advocacy of secular liber liberalism. It was UP English professor Josefina Constantino who actually brought the alleg allegations against Pasquale in 1961. Her charges were based on the testimony of a former student and employee of the president's office, Amelita Recio Cruz. Cruz claimed that Pasqual had led her to other uh, and other students to book club meetings where communist doctrine, doctrines were being discussed. In his defense, uh, Pasqual explained that the term buklod was merely a figment of the imagination of those who were thinking that the philosophical group he was organizing was a communist front. This group to which he was advisor and le lecturer was no other than the Philosophical Association mm -hmm. of the Philippines, an organization registered with an address in Pondo, 
where meetings were open to public and were basically experimentations on the use of the national language and philosophical discourse. Failing to prove Pascual's communist uh, leanings, Constantino then elaborated on his alleged godlessness and that he was using logical posit positivism to spread agnosticism which in turn was maliciously making young minds more receptive to communist indoctrination. And for Constantino, Pascual was numero uno in the practice of brujeria or witchcraft, attesting to his capacity to hypnotize and brainwash young minds and luring them into the communist fold. Patricia Abinales in a Rappler, sorry, Patricia Abinales in a Rappler article published in 2016 tells us how a former student of Pascual recalls, and I quote, how the philosophy professor shocked him and his classmates by spitting on the image of Jesus Christ just to show that God was nothing but a figment of their fears and imagination. Abinales attests that many did become atheists and agnostics after taking his class. It is true, however, that the case against Pascual during the Kafa witch hunt was unsubstantiated and in fact a remake of an old charge, one that Constantino herself raised not in 1961, but in the mid 1950s at the height of what Yabis would call as new peace religious wars. In 1955, it was actually not Pascual who was facing charges, but Constantino herself for unscrupulously submitting to the military intelligence services the names of professors she was suspecting of harboring subversive ideas. And ironically, it was Recio Cruz herself who filed the charge, the person whom Constantino invited to submit Pascual's name to an MIS officer. When Constantino was being interrogated by the Board of Regents, she admitted that she was not certain of Pascual's communist leanings, but was sure that he was ex exerting a kind of, and I quote, a tyranny over the mind of his students. Constantino claimed that she felt justified in reporting Pascual to the MIS to prevent intellectuals like him for abusing, from abusing his authority and to awaken a sense of moral responsibility to their students. But if one reads uh, Rezio Cruz's letter to the chairman of the board of regents, dated February 21, 1955, one learns that she was not just accusing Constantino, but also UP President Vidal Tan for using his position to promote sectarian interests by intentionally replacing philosophy faculty members, sending Santos Cuyugan and Cesar Mahul to American universities in 1953 as fellows in sociology and political science, respectively. And this in order to ensure the appointment of his own recruit, a certain Jose Eliazar, a graduate of the Pontifical University of Santo Tomas and the American Jesuit University of Fordham. But even sending uh, Kuyugan and Mahul for further studies in the social sciences proved to be a calculated move. In his endorsement letter to the Dean, Pasquale notes how he had been repeatedly told that, and I quote, President Tan was not contemplating to send abroad for study in the field of philosophy, anyone from the Department of Philosophy. And this corrob corroborates a statement made by UP professor of psychology and founder of Psicologia Filipino, Virgilio Enriquez, who claims that the sending of philosophy faculty members on Ford and Rockefeller scholarships to study social sciences instead of philosophy was a deliberate attempt to weaken and neutralize the department. And he mentions here not only Mahul and Cuyugan, but also Alfredo Lagmay and Jose Encarnacion. Aside from Vidal Tan, one key figure in this clash between sectarian forces and their secular libertarian adversaries was the American Jesuit chaplain, Father John Delaney, who was responsible for building the UP Student Catholic Action into an extensive and highly centralized network. While he was seen by admirers as a charismatic man who selflessly built a community nurtured by the Catholic faith, his adversaries saw him as a meddler who posed a grave threat to the state's university's non-sectarian tradition. 
he did not rally, he, he did not just rally the students and faculty members to demand the abolition of fraternities and sororities in campus uh, in order to make way for UPSCA members to secure power. He also went on a crusade against UP professors suspected of being atheists or communists by sending students to their classes to spy and report on their ideological leanings. And with Dunn's support, Delaney's campaign escalated into the McCarthyite witch hunts in the early 60s. And while some academics chose to suffer silently, others created the Society of, for the Advancement of Academic Freedom, who came out with a manifesto in 1955, signed by 159 faculty and employees, condemning UPSCA for exerting strong pressure towards conformity and creating an atmosphere of tension, suspicion, and fear. And then again, mobilized in 1961 to protect, pro protest sorry, the Kafa witch hunt. Elmer Ordonez writes that while such movement was going on, Pascual referred, preferred to fight alone. He was known for his fearlessness in faculty meetings, opposing single-handedly President Tan's proposal to dissolve symbolic logic. It would be hard to gauge how Pascual felt back then, but judging from his interviews with the Philippine Collegian, he appeared relatively calm and unscathed. When he was, for example, asked how the Kafa cross examinations made him feel, he retorted that he felt, and I quote, just like a professor answering candidly the queries of my students. And as for the allegation that he was a communist, he scoffed at the incompetence of his critics, pointing out that they had obviously failed to dig into his writings and how they have not accomplished even a tenth of what he has written against communism. For Pascual, who believed and perceived himself as a rational thinker, a man of the Enlightenment, who took pride in being guided by reason, such debates could only flaunt his per perfectly sharp mind. Another important fact that, uh, that can explain why Pasquale became a target of the Inquisition back then was that he was part of a, of a whole generation of scholars who tried to uphold intellectual freedom amidst what they per perceived as sectarian aggression who were faithful to Rafael Palma's secular liberalism. Pascual studied in the University of Chicago uh, in the mid-1930s and was working with the British analytic philosopher Bertrand Russell, one of the leading proponents of the logical positivist movement. When Pascual came back from his studies, he tried to spread the gospel of positivism by applying the scientific method of symbolic logic. But for Pascual, it was not merely a fad, but an indispensable tool in analyzing sociopolitical issues and solving the crises of our times. But I argue that while symbolic logic was crucial as a method, José Rizal was Pascual's intellectual hero, the inspiration behind his philosophical inquiry. He claims that Rizal exposed the church wrought by human passions and errors, not out of spite, but out of love for humanity, urging everyone to have a sense of self-esteem, to, and I quote, look at his own affairs through the prism of his own judgment and self-love. Naturally, Pasquale regarded it as a serious impediment that people were ignorant of results writing and the reason why we remain in the same deplorable situation. But it was precisely this love for Rizal that are urged, sorry, that urged Pasquale to write his book, Rizal Beyond the Grave, which Aleto explains was reprinted in 1950 as a way to undermine the anti-communist Catholic Church's attempted co-optation of Rizal at the time of the Hope Rebellion. When Pasquale wrote the book in 1935, it was a response to represent Rizal as an ally of the church who at the end of his life retracted his anti-Catholic writing and Masonic affiliation. This retraction was supposedly discovered on May 18, 1935 by Father Manuel Garcia in the vault of the Archbishop of Manila. Only a few months later, on November 15, 1935, Pascual responded with the publication of his book, saying that considering the fact that the document was providentially misplaced, and brought to light at that providential hour, found lying in that providential vault, 
it all seemed to him too providential all the way through. I will not go through the details of this book, but Pasquale here tries to prove that such retraction was simply irreconcilable with the character of a man whose life had been guided by reason. What I will mention is that the second edition of the book was published in 1950 as a response to a revival of interest in Rizal's controversial retraction. At that time, Rafael Palma's prize-winning biography of Rizal had just come out and made reference to Pasquale's graphology study of the retraction that document. The Catholics, however, were opposed to using Palma's book as required reading for high school students, denouncing its unfounded accusation against the Jesuit fathers as part of an anti-Catholic and Masonic propaganda. But the so-called sectarian aggression did not end there. One could say that it appeared not only in the attempt to castigate Pasquale through the witch hunts of 1961, or Claro M. Recto's persecution in relation to the Rizal Bill in the mid-1950s. There was also the case of censorship of Teodoro Agoncillo's review of Pasquale's book. Agoncillo, who had just graduated with a bachelor's degree in philosophy, had written a review in praise of Pasquale's analysis of Rizal's retraction. And here, the irreverent Agoncillo did not only call the forger of the document the devil, but also argued that it could only have been, and I quote, the providential devil who placed the document in the archive. I believe that there is so much to know about Pasquale, not only in his writings about Rizal, but also his idea of partyless democracy deserves a second look. After 34 years as a professor and administrator at UP, Pasquale went to America in 1967. He was given a teaching position at the philosophy department in Bradley University, Illinois, and was later awarded Professor Emeritus after having taught 10 years until his re retirement in 1977. In 1985, Pasquale died an expatriate at the age of 73, but his legacy lingers and people today still hear tales about the battles which this philosopher valent valiantly fought back in the day. Thank you. That's all. Shamam, for your discussion and uh, your sharing. So please uh, stand by for our Q&A later on after our last speaker. Now moving on to our second speaker. So our, our second speaker with the topic, si Emerita S. Quito at ang pagbabalik sa pagpapahalaga bilang panulakan ng edukasyong Pilipino, let us welcome Dr. Jerwin Mahagway. Sir. Isang maalab na hapon sa ating lahat. Maalab dahil uh, sa kabila ng pandemya at ng kalamidad ay nandito pa rin tayo at nakikibahagi upang balikan ang mga ipinamana sa atin ng mga naunang pantas sa ating larangan. Bagaman alam ko na nagpahinga lang tayo at bukas ay muli tayong babalik upang lingapin ang mga kapatid natin na nangangailangan. Lalo na dito sa lalawigan namin sa Rizal, sa Isabela at Cagayan. Ngayon din sa Katanduanes. Ngayon ay uh, nais kong ibahagi sa inyo ang aking uh, pagninilay para kay Professor Emerita Quito. Ito ay may pamagat na si Emerita Quito at ang pagbalik sa pagpapahalaga bilang panulukan ng edukasyong Pilipino. Pag sinabing panulukan ay pundasyon. So gusto kong hanapin yung pundasyon ng edukasyong Pilipino na panukala ni Professor Emerita Quito. Pero bago ako magpatuloy ay nais ko munang ibahagi ang isang linya buhat sa ambahan ng mga mangyan. Dahil ako ay taga Mindoro, ito ay yung isa sa mga paborito ko. Ako ay nagsaing ganang isang gatang, sobra sa marami, sa isa ay kulang. Um, sa Mindoro kapag pumunta ka, lalo na sa mga kapatid na mangyan, wala mang ganun karaming bigas pero kahit kagano kayo karami ay makakatikim kayo or makakakain kayo. Ibig sabihin, pag hati hatian kung ano ang meron. 
bilang isang Mindoreño, ganun din ang dala ko ngayon. Isang gatang nabigas lamang, isang gatang nakalaman. Kung ikukumpara sa iba ay marami higit na marunong, pero hari manawari, may matutunan kayo sa akin. Uh, bago tayo magpatuloy sa filosofiya ng edukasyon ni Merita Kito ay magandang balikan natin at tanungin, may filosofiya ba ng edukasyon sa Pilipinas? Kung marami sa ating mga kababayan ang gusto ay pumunta sa ibang bansa, bata pa lamang ay nangangarap na tayo na magtrabaho sa ibang bansa. May filosofiya pa ng edukasyon sa Pilipinas kung ang nakikita natin ay debate ng mga relihiyon. Kung sa pamilya ay relihiyon ang pinag-uusapan, sa bahay ay relihiyon. May filosofiya ba ng edukasyon sa Pilipinas kung lumalaki ng mga kabataan ngayon na ang gusto ay kumain sa McDo o sa Jollibee? Hindi kaya manood ng K-pop, manood ng basketball. Ano ba ang meron sa ating bansa? Kung babalikan natin yung uh, kabuuan ng filosofiya ng edukasyon sa silangan at sa kanluran, ay uh, napakalayo na. Pero tayo sa Pilipinas, nandito pa lang tayo. Batang-bata pa tayo. Pero gusto kong sabihin na buhay at pumapalag ang mga pilosopo na nagtitika sa filosofiya ng edukasyon. Sa aking papel ay nandiyan si Jose Rizal, si Renato Constantino at si Emerita Quito. Sa puntong ito ay nais kong ibahagi sa inyo ang uh, filosofiya ng edukasyon ni Emerita Quito na sa aking palagay ay isa sa mga pantas na kailangan nating balikan lalo na sa kasalukuyang sitwasyon ng bansa natin. Si, sino nga ba si Professor Emerita Quito? Isinilang siya noong 1929 sa San Fernando, Pampanga at nag-aaral ng bachelier sa filosofiya sa Universidad ng Santo Tomas noong 1949. Nakakuha ng masterado sa filosofiya noong 1956 sa UST pa rin. At doktorado sa filosofiya sa Switzerland. Nagturo siya sa pamantasan ng Santo Tomas, Ateneo de Manila, Assumption at De La Salle. Ngayon kung tatanungin nyo, meron ba akong personal na ugnayan? O nakadao pang palad ko ba si Professor Emerita Esquito? May kababaang loob kong sasabihin na hindi. Pero nakadao pang diwa ko siya. Dahil uh, sa aking uh, pag-aaral sa kanya ay halos nabasa ko ang marami. Kung hindi man lahat ay marami sa kanyang mga naisulat. At nakita ko ang kanyang uh, mga isinusulong. Sa ngayon nga ay ibabahagi ko sa inyo yung uh, tungkol sa kanyang filosofiya ng edukasyon na naging tema ng aking desertasyon. Ang sabi ni Professor Emerita Quito, ang filosofiya ng edukasyon sa Pilipinas ay dapat tumutugon sa kagawiang Pilipino, maglalagay ng kaayusan sa mga katangiang negatibo. Siguro pinakamadaling tanong dyan ay uh, ano yung mga negatibong katangian? Bagaman hindi may papaliwanag lahat dahil sa limitasyon ng oras, gusto kong magbigay ng mga ilan lamang para nang sa ganun ay makapasok tayo sa pundasyon ng kanyang filosofiya. Halimbawa na lamang ay may dalawang inhinyero na natasang gumawa ng tulay. Sabihin natin na yung isa ay galing sa ibang bansa at yung isa ay Pilipino. Ngayon, Pareho naman sila ng pinag-aralan, parehong pumasa sa mga pagsusulit ng kanilang pamahalaan. Sa mga tuwid ay masasabi natin na pareho silang may alam. Subalit ang tanong, bakit halimbawa na lang bakit ang ginawa ng Pilipino ay maayos at yung uh, sa isa naman ay higit na maayos? Saan may problema? Gusto kong sabihin, batay sa sa filosofiya ni Emerita Quito, uh, pagdating sa kaalaman, pareho lamang sila kasi yung 1 plus 1 sa Pilipinas ay equals 2. Ganon din sa Amerika. O kahit sa ang bansa, yung 1 plus 1 ay 2 pa rin. So, ibig sabihin, walang problema sa kaalaman. So, saan may problema? May problema sa pagpapahalaga. So, kung pagano yung gagamiting pera dun sa pondo, ano yung materialis na bibili, nakadepende sa pagpapahalaga. Sino ba yung pinapahalagahan ng inenyero? Dito sa Pilipinas, sa pagtitika ni Dr. Emerita Quito, ang edukasyon natin ay may pagkukulang sa pagpapahalaga. 
At ito dapat yung kailangang balikan natin. Bakit? So, yung problema sa pill health, ay uh, biro lang, yung problema sa drugs, problema sa basura, sa kahirapan, sa maraming populasyon, maraming anak, problema sa eleksyon, problema ng pagkapahalaga. Ano ba yung pagkapahalaga na nilalagay natin sa ating uh, sistema ng edukasyon? Kasi hindi natin pwedeng sabihin na neutral yung education. Lahat ng edukasyon ay uh, may interest, may bahid na pinapanigan. So, ito yung kung babalikan natin yung sinasabing pagkapahalaga, ito yung pagtalakay ni Dr. Kito tungkol sa pagkapahalaga. May dalawang bahagdan o palapag ang pagkapahalaga. Ang una ay yung pagkapahalaga buwat sa kamalayan o sintido. Ito ay bahagi na ng mga batas ng lipunan, pamilya at paaralan. Sa gayon ay hindi ito pinipili ng isang tao at sa halip ay nabubuo na lamang sa kaniya ng hindi namamalayan. So itong pagkapahalaga na ito yung kinagista natin na bumubuo sa atin. Maaring sa pamilya, sa relihiyon, sa politika, sa makatwid, ito ay nasa atin na may malay man tayo o wala. Ngayon, uh, ang hangarin ng ang hangarin dito ay makarating tayo dun sa tinatawag natin na uh, ikalawang antas at yun yung mataas na antas ng pagkapahalaga. Ito ay yung kalagayan na nababalangkas na ng isang tao kung ano ang kasiyasiya o kapakipakinabang batay sa kaniyang pagumuni-muni. Kailangan ay lumampas tayo sa sinasabi ng lipunan na kung saan maaari na tayong magdesisyon, hindi lang sinabi ng, ng mga nakatataas, ng ating uh, pinuno, kundi dahil ito na yung sa palagay natin ay higit na mabuti. Kung kung sakalit makarating na tayo sa ganitong uh, pamantayan, ano naman yung magiging batayan ng ating pagpapahalaga? Yun yung magandang tanong na dapat nating makita tungkol sa sinasabi ni Professor Emerita Quito. Ano yung pamantayan na dapat nating tingnan para masabi na maging basihan ng mataas na antas ng pagpapahalaga? Balikan natin yung sabi niya. Ang pinakatungkulin ng mga pamantasan ay pandayin sa mga kabataan ng kakayahang mag-isip ng kritikal. So ito yung basihan na gusto, gusto kong ipakita sa inyo na pamantayan ni, ni Dr. Emerita Quito na ang pamantayan ay yung kritikal na pag-iisip o kritikal na pananaw. Ano yung kritikal na pananaw? Ito ay lumalampas sa pagunawa ng mga batas at struktura ng lohika at tumutukoy sa pagunawa ng tao sa kanyang kalagayan sa lipunan. Magandang tingnan ngayon na itong kung yung isang tao na may kritikal na pananaw, una ay nakikita niya yung kabuuan. So ibig sabihin, kung bibilin siyang produkto, nakikita yung epekto nito sa kanyang sarili, sa kanyang pamayanan at sa kanyang bansa, di ba? Nakikita yung kalagayan niya sa lipunan at pamatagalang ugnayan ng kanyang ginagawa at ng lipunan. Nakikita niya yung buong larawan at daloy ng kapangyarihan at ng mga naapi. Ibig sabihin, kapag bumoboto ka, isipin mo, ano ang naging epekto nito sa akin, sa aking pamilya, sa aking bayan, sa aking bansa at sa pangkalahatan. Ibig sabihin, nagkakaroon ka na ngayon ng mataas na pagdinilay. Ngayon, kung dadali natin yan dito sa una nating pinag-aralan, so ano ba talaga pagdating sa, o oh, halimbawa sa OFW, sabi ni Emerita Quito, ang pinakamasamang maaaring mangyari sa isang bansa, lalo na sa Third World, gaya ng Pilipinas, ay ang walang humpay na paglisan at pananatili sa ibang bansa ng kanyang mga profesional. Galing yan mismo sa kanyang isinulat na filosofiya ng edukasyon sa diwang Pilipino. Ngayon, so kung iisipin natin, halos ang mga kabataan ngayon, gustong makarating sa ibang bansa at makapagtrabaho. Pero dito sa aspeto na to, Maganda yung sinasabi na hindi ito makakatulong sa atin. Bagaman hindi tayo again sa mga OFW, uh, mga OFW ay uh, maubait, sila ay maubuting tao, pero gusto nating sabihin na hindi sila bayani kundi sila ay biktima. Biktima sila ng maling kaisipan na nagpapatuloy, nadaladala ng edukasyon kasi lahat tayo ay salarin dyan. 
So, wag na nating hayaan na yung ating mga anak at ako ay uh, magpapaalam sa atin at pupunta sa ibang bansa. Magkakawatak-watak ang pamilya para makapagtrabaho. Marahil lang solusyon ay pag-isipan natin kung paano pa rin yung bansa natin. Hindi ang umalis sa bansang ito. Ngayon, yung pagdating naman sa relihiyon, kailangan kailangan ng critical na pananaw. Halimbawa, pag-isipan natin bakit sa translation sa Quiapo ay uh, basura yung naiiwan. Ibig sabihin, may problema dun sa pananampalataya at dun sa paraan. Bakit sa eleksyon ay napakalaki ng ginagampanan ng mga relihiyon? O nakapili ba tayo ng tamang kandidato? So, kailangan nating pagnilayan. Hindi naman natin sinasabi na mali yung mga relihiyon. Ang sinasabi lang natin ay pagnilayan natin yung ating pananampalataya. Pangalawa ay paano naman pinapahalagahan? Ano yung pinapahalagahan ng mga bata ngayon? Marami sa mga kabataan natin o kahit sa mga professionals nanonood ng uh, Korean novelas, gustong makarating sa Korea. Wala namang masama dyan. Pero kung, kung yung mga anak natin, eh, ganyan na rin yung ginagawa at lahat tayo ganyan ang ginagawa, makakatulong ba sa atin yan? Ano yung epekto sa atin? Kung bata pa lang, na, nasasanay na nakapag umiiyak, dadalhin sa Jollibee o sa McDonald's, anong itinatanim natin na kamalayan sa mga bata? O ngayon pa lang ay puro gadget na. So anong values ang meron sa ating mga kabataan? Turuan natin silang magtanong. Turuan natin silang maghanap ng solusyon. So, huwag natin silang uh, hayaan kung ano yung makapagbibigay sa kanila ng kaligayahan. Turuan natin makita nila yung sarili nila at yung lipunan. So, yung critical na pananaw na to, yung pagpapahalaga na may critical na pananaw, malaki ang epekto, lalo na sa ating bansa. So, gusto kong tingnan nyo na uh, nationalistic si Emerita Quito, pero hindi yung nationalist mo ang nauuna kundi yung critical na pananaw na nakatali sa nakatali ang nasyonalismo. Tingnan natin halimbawa sa Singapore, sa unang mga taon ng kanilang pag-aaral, hindi naman 1 plus 1 agad ang tinuturo. Ang tinuturo ay yung pagmamahal sa bansa nila. Tinuturong maglinis. Kaya pag lumaki, mga responsible citizen. Sa Japan, uh, yung mga kabataan, sila yung naglilinis sa kanilang lugar. Kaya sa eskwelahan, may mga iilang janitor din naman, pero yung paglilinis talaga, halimbawa sa CR, ay uh, mga kabataan na kaya nagkakaroon ng responsibilidad. Mauunawaan nila yung sarili nila at yung lipunan. Ngayon, dito, hindi tinuturo yung pagumahal sa bayan. Ang tinuturo muna ay responsibilidad, pagpapahalaga. Kasi kung mauunawaan mo yung sarili mo, mauunawaan mo yung pagpapahalaga sa bayan. Mamahalin mo yung bayan mo. Gayon din ay uh, magandang tingnan da sa pilosopiya ni Merita Quito, yung pagpapahalaga ng may kritikal na pananaw ay tuturuan tayo na mahalin yung wika natin. Kasi nung nag-aaral siya sa ibang bansa, sa Europa, uh, ang akala niya ay matutuwa sa kanya yung mga kasama niya kasi magaling siyang mag-ingles. Pero hindi pala. Ang kinakatuwa nila ay kapag ginagamit mo yung sarili mong wika. So, ang, ang nag-iisip na tao, Darating yung panahon na may isip mo na kailangan mong gamitin yung wika mo. Kasi may bubunyag lamang ang malalim na kalungkutan at damdamin o pighati kung hindi sa sariling wika. Ngayon, ang tanong ay hindi naman to ginagamit. Madali lang. Di ko unlad ang wikang Pilipino kung hindi ito gagamitin. Bigyan natin ng pagkakataon. Kaya nga si Professor Emerita Quito ay maraming may sulat sa wikang Pilipino. Ngayon, sa huli, Nais nice kong sabihin na wala, hanggang walang isang matibay na pilosopiyang pangedukasyon, mananatiling hungkag ang lahat ng mga pagkukunyag yung nilalaan sa paghahandang pangkaisipan ng mga kabataan ng bayan. Kasi kailangan talaga natin na may focus tayo, may, may basihan. Sa uli ay uh, marahil tama si pilosopong Tasyo, di lahat ay natutulog sa madilim na gabi ng bayang ito. Dahil may mga nag-iisip at nandyan si Emerita Quito. Isa siya sa mga nag-iisip nung panahong marami ang mga natutulog. Marahil ito yung hamon sa atin ngayon na 
kailangan tayong mga nag-aaral ng pilosofiya ay uh, kailangan mag-isip habang yung iba ay ang iniisip ay Dota, ang iniisip ay manood ng K-pop, pag nilaya natin, ano ba yung pilosofiya ng edukasyon na nararapat sa bansa natin? Hanggang dito na lang at uh, sana yung may natutunan kayo. Maraming salamat. Ayan, maraming salamat po, Sir Dr. Jerwin Mahagway. Standby po ulit for the Q&A pagkatapos po ng last speaker natin. Now, finally, moving on to our last speaker to share about Rolando Gripaldo, the Filipino philosopher at the margins. Let us all welcome Dr. Rodrigo Abenes. Sir. Okay. Uh... Good morning, uh, good afternoon. So I just wanted to uh, give you an anecdote. So uh, I am a student of uh, Gripaldo the philosopher, but I'm not uh, the student of uh, Gripaldo the, the man. So I was not able to, hindi kami nagkita uh, in the Lasal. It's because when I went to Lasal, uh, he was already retired in 2008. So that's the, that's the reason why. But uh, my, my, my tribute is uh, entitled uh, Rolando Gripaldo, the, the Filipino philosopher at the, the margins. So this is just a simple tribute. It's because uh, I just wanted to explore on the contribution of uh, Rolando Gripaldo or Dr. Grips uh, for his students and close friends uh, in, in, in the philosophical circle. Dr. Grips is known not only uh, for his dedication in the articulation of uh, Filipino philosophy, but also in showcasing it in the international philosophical community. It was for this reason that his uh, name is almost synonymous to Filipino philosophy. It's because if one will ask if there's still Filipino philosophy, I think it will be better for you to read the, the writings of Dr. Gripaldo. These are all in his academia account. And uh, the purpose of this paper is to explore on the contribution of uh, Gripaldo to Filipino philosophy. It's because it's high time to assess the magnitude of his legacy. So in order to do this, uh, I divided uh, my work into, into this discussion. So number one is the introduction, the discussions on the intellectual biography, and the discussions on Gripaldo's intellectual project and number four is a discussion on the three approaches to Philippine philosophy and uh, the contribution to the Philippine philosophical discourses. So it's quite an irony that there are only few scholars. Okay? Uh, his, the contribution of Rolando Gripaldo in Filipino philosophy is quite unmeasured. But it's quite an irony that there are only few scholars who attempted to write about his legacy. His name was not even included in the list of the Filipino philosopher in the works of Alfredo Co entitled Doing Philosophy in the Philippines. The only scholars who wrote about him are Demeterio and J.J. Joaquin and Gripaldo himself. Another irony was that Dr. Grips was not even given honor and given tribute during the 40th year anniversary of PAP conference entitled Legacy Lectures Engaging Our Philosophical Pioneers, which was held in the La Salle University, wherein they honored Abulad, Po, D, Garcia, Ornedo, Ferriols, Mendoza, Mercado, D, Quito, Reyes, Timbresa, and Tuibeo. And with all of this, we could consider him, therefore, as the Filipino philosopher at the margins. So uh, my discussion is divided into three. Okay, so first one is I wanted to take a look on the internal biography of uh, Rolando Gripaldo. And third, second is the discussions on Gripaldo's project and uh, approaches to Filipino philosophy. And another is his contribution, particularly his way of institutionalizing and inter internationalizing uh, Filipino philosophy. So based on my analysis on his intellectual biography, I divided his, his biography into this. We have the formative years, the foreignization, 
and then we have the inward Filipinization, and then the out outward uh, Filipinization. So the formative years, it's quite they uh, Rolando Gripaldo is a unique thinker. What makes him a unique thinker is because he was formed as a philosopher with different philosophical traditions because of his initial training in the now uh, state university. And it's quite surprising that in the state of philosophy of uh, Emerita Quito, the MSU was not even mentioned okay, as, okay, as the, the universities who are offering, okay, uh, particularly uh, philosophy as, as, uh, as a program wherein uh, Dr. Quito only mentioned the big four universities such as uh, UP, UST, another is Ateneo, and third, uh, fourth one is uh, De La Salle. Okay? And in the discussions of Emerita Quito, he made the discussions that these different schools have different philosophical inclinations. But as early as 1960s, Marawi, or particularly Mindanao State University in Marawi uh, City, has particularly a very different approach in teaching philosophy. It's because the approach is particularly eclectic. Why eclectic? It's because of the different philosophy teachers who are who eventually become the teachers of Roland Ripaldo. They have the it has become the poster home of American Peace Corps, which made him. Rolando Gripaldo being exposed to uh, to analytic tradition, okay, to ethics, and to other philosophical discourses, and then after that, okay, he was been, he is also exposed to to Oriental philosophy. It's because one of his professor he mentioned that in his philosophical development that there was an expert of Indian philosophy or particularly Oriental philosophy, and then after that, okay. After his uh, graduation in, in AB philosophy, he decided to, to study his MA in philosophy in the University of the Philippines. It's because according to him, his philosophical temperament and disposition at that time was analytic. His thesis, I think undergrad thesis, is about Bertrand Russell. And of course, if you wanted to study analytic tradition, you need to go to UP. Because UP was well known for his for its analytic tradition that was introduced by uh, Ricardo uh, Pascual, a well-known Filipino student of Bertrand Russell. Pero hindi na naging teacher niya si Ricardo Pascual. It has been explained to to us by uh, Dr. Precious. Ang naging teacher niya is uh, Armando Bonifacio. So and then after uh, finishing, okay, I call it foreignization. Okay. Why foreignization? It's because it still has no interest at all into studying, okay, particularly our own intellectual heritage. And then the the, the idea came up okay, with Gripaldo on the Filipinization, and is when he started to to teach particularly basic courses okay, in MSU particularly Japanese philosophy, Chinese, Indian philosophy, philosophy of education, philosophy of human person, and philosophy of history. But he later on uh, realized that these are all foreign in nature. So it does not actually, it's not, it's not something that is very rooted in our, in our lived experiences. So that's why he started to, to explore into the idea of our own intellectual heritage that is particularly his his project i call it inward filipinization and then he decided to to enroll for phd not in philosophy but in philippine studies in in up it's because the reason is he wanted to to is somehow interested into looking into the idea of of exploring into the Filipino philosophy, which at that time, talagang malaking problema. So, wala, wala pang nag-explore into this this idea. It's only uh, Father Mercado and Tembresa is still a student at that time. So, and with that, okay, he studied under Armando Bonifacio and uh, 
and other programs or other professors in the Philippine studies. And then sooner or later, when he went back to MSU, he served as a dean for for in in dean for uh, liberal arts. And then sooner or later, I uh, he wrote a review on the state of philosophy uh, in the Philippines, uh, particularly written by uh, Dr. Quito. Later on, I'm going to discuss what are those content of uh, the, the critique of uh, Dr. Gripaldo about the state of philosophy of uh, Quito. And then sooner or later, he started doing his work on the traditional doing of uh, Filipino philosophy. And then in 1994, uh, Dr. Gripaldo decided to teach in Manila. And he found refuge in De La Salle University. And in De La Salle, he works particularly on synthesizing the taxonomy okay, about Filipino philosophy and also his critical bibliography, which uh, Tomas Rosario considered as the magnus opus of uh, the, the work of uh, Dr. Gripaldo. And then in 2007, he decided to dedicate his time in the management of uh, PNPRS and Philosophia Journal until his untimely death in 2017. I called it, okay, this one, the outward uh, Philippinization, okay? This is has something to do with, okay? And then third one is the lack of support for intellectual heritage research. So, wala tayong, wala tayong support. That's why, that is the, the reason why, okay, there is particularly the underdevelopment of Filipino uh, philosophy. Now, Rolando Gripaldo is known for his three approaches in Filipino philosophy. And this can be seen in his okay, uh, particularly works, okay, uh, Filipino philosophy. Although he, in this later work, he only mentioned about uh, the latest work that he had done that, is, that was published in Philosophia is about the cultural approach. But that cultural approach is something that is very different from the approach of uh, Leonardo Mercado. So he criticized Leonardo Mercado and also uh, Tim Bresa regarding this one. And then the other one, okay, particularly in his critical bibliography, and that is the critical, okay, the critical approach. So now, uh, I think before we proceed into the discussions of these approaches, we need to, to define first okay, what is Filipino philosophy. But before we define Filipino philosophy, we need to take a look on how Gripaldo understood okay, uh, Filipino and philosophy. Gripaldo was aware that the term uh, Filipino is a historical concept. Okay? He's a Mindanaoan. He was aware that this, the term Filipino is a, a slippery concept. It was for this reason that as a starting point, okay, he used the constitutional approach or concept in Filipino. For according to him, this concept is something that is most inclusive. For him, Filipino philosophy should not be understood, okay, not in the terms of the plot or of past, present, but future, uh, uh, present, future oriented. That's something that he borrowed from Emboscado. And this thinking is needed in order to understand that Filipino is something that is an a posteriori category. Though Gripaldo insisted that towards present future, he, he, he insisted the approach towards present future, but he insisted that there's still an importance of tracing okay, its intellectual umbilical cord by looking at okay, the philosopher by the, the, traditional, the traditional approach. So now, in understanding philosophy, okay, for Gripaldo, there is okay, particularly difficulties because philosophy has shades of different meanings. He recognized various philosophers from the history of philosophy, from ancient philosophy to contemporary philosophy, okay? and we realize that okay, it has a very different understanding of philosophy. And the definition of philosophy as the love of wisdom okay, has been challenged since time immemorial, a philosopher that 
or according to him, is to transcend okay, to the various epoch of history of different philosophical schools of philosophy and consider all their ways and activities. And according to him, the only way that defines philosophy is through the doctrine of the I mean, resemblances, which he borrowed from Christian science. And then, now, according to Gripaldo, okay, what is the task of the philosopher? So he made different categories, that there are teachers of philosophy, scholars of philosophy, historian of philosophy, and genuine philosopher. And according to him, the first is simply okay, those teachers of philosophy who teach in schools and universities. For Gripaldo, there are also scholars of philosophy. And then this historian of philosophy are something that is very interesting. It's because he made mention of the difference between cobblestone and also uh, Bertrand Russell. Okay? For example, we can name cobblestone as a historian of philosopher, philosophy, but not, okay, but not a, a philosopher. But Bertrand Russell was able to transcend, okay? And he is a historian of philosopher and at the same time, a philosopher. And then, what is the difference between a scholar of philosophy and a genuine philosopher? It's because a, a, a scholar of philosophy are those someone who just mimic okay, the ideas of the philosopher. Okay? So, who just systematize okay, the philosophy of the philosopher. For Gripaldo, okay, he said that a genuine philosopher needs to grow either outside or within philosophers' lectures and writings. But it does not mean that he is okay, or she is a genuine philosopher. It's because there's still a need to innovate or okay, some only imitates acts and mimic ideas. Okay? Uh, we can, okay, and in short, according to him, okay, a genuine philosopher needs to innovate from Kanchan to neo Kanchan, or reject a school of thought and create a new path of philosophical question or a new novel insight of philosophical reflections. So now, we now go to the, the three approaches of Filipino philosophy. For Gripaldo, we have three approaches. That is the cultural approach, the constitutional approach, and the traditional approach, okay? And the cultural approach is also known as the anthropological approach, okay, wherein okay, he used cultural instead of anthropological based on the suggestion of Maclean. Okay, so Maclean is the one who gave the foreword in the in the book of uh, uh, Dr. Gripaldo. Okay, so that any social science approach in philosophy is called cultural in nature, and according to him. We should also make a distinction between an ethno, this is something that is very interesting, an ethno philosopher from a philosopher of culture. Gripaldo agrees with Mercado and Timbresa that philosophy emerges from one's culture for it does not exist in a vacuum. It is manifested in a person's reflection of their cultural lived experiences, time, people's languages, songs, myth, idols and the like, but though this is something that is embedded in one's culture, it can be disembedded for the culture by an ethno philosopher or by a historian or scholar philosopher. Because once disembedded, philosophy may turn around and try to critique that culture in order to, to refine it. Now, let's go to the the second approach, okay, the, the the constitutional approach, which according to Dr. Joaquin is something that is very problematic. When Dr. Joaquin made a critical assessment, particularly comparing the idea of Filipino philosophy of Mapacquiao and also Ripaldo. But my answer into this, that one is because we need to understand that uh, Dr. Grips is also a bibliographer. Without this approach, I think Gripaldo will not be able to, to produce a very important work, a very important legacy, and that is his critical bibliography 
you try to imagine from 1974 to 2008, wherein he collected all of those articles, those works of different the scholars, which was considered by Tomas Rosario as a landmark in the history of research in the world of Filipino philosophical thinkers and scholars, which according to Dr. Rosario, no similar achievement of this magnitude, as far as I know, has ever been done or published, for no one is tempted to assert that this is his magnus opus, and he notes, however, that this is an ongoing project every five years, which one measures it in terms of time, effort, sacrifice invested in terms of its immeasurable value to the current future scholars of Filipino philosophy. It is then an outstanding and probable and unsurpassable scholarship fit. So now to, to the traditional approach, is that okay according to which is okay, primarily the approach that Gripaldo is advocating is that it is truly something that is philosophical approach that has been used by historians of philosophy it's because it follows the Greek philosophical approach or model and identifies Filipino individual philosophers where Gripaldo discusses their respective ideas and contribution to the philosophical discourses in the Philippines. In this book, he discuss about the philosophy of Rizal, Bonifacio, Jacinto, Quezon, another Laurel, and another is Renato Constantino. And in his white book, he discuss Emboscado, Claro Sinisa, and another is Cyrilia and himself. Okay, so that is another one. Now, uh, I, I would like to end, okay, particularly this one. This is something that is a continuing or legacy okay, of this is a, the legacy of Dr. Grips. And that is his attempt to towards the institutionalization of and nationalization of philosophy. I think this particular this is particularly in response uh, to the third identified hindrance to the development of philosophy in the Philippines. That is there is no of support okay, towards the intellectual development okay, of our own intellectual heritage. I suspect that okay, uh, if you're going to visit the curriculum vitae of Dr. Gripaldo in this website, in our journal in Philosophia, you're going to see in, in his CV that he retired okay, at, at two, uh, twice, okay, in the government and, and then in LaSalle. What's the reason behind why he moved to Metropol? Anyway, he has a very good life in, 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 in MSU, a very promising career. And I think okay, there's a need okay, for Dr. Gripaldo to move to the center, that is from periphery to the center. 1994, so as to contribute towards the institutionalization and internationalization of philosophy. And when he joined De La Salle in 1994 as full-time faculty, he worked tirelessly into this endeavor, particularly okay, uh, research, and I think he encourages the faculty members of De La Salle uh, to, do, to write okay, and to uh, actually revived Sophia, and now we have the, the Sophia. And then now, Philosophia is being recognized as, as one of, okay, actually, a premier journal in, in the Philippines. Okay? So, ito yung mga, mga Scopus uh, and ISI journal na talagang, we cannot really separate Philosophia, okay, PNPRS, from, from, the, from the life of Dr. Gripaldo. Is because after his retirement, Dr. Gripaldo dedicated his, his life and an, a, a night before okay, his death, he's in fact, okay, according to Dr. Aguas, editing okay, particularly uh, articles okay, and other works okay, in, in Philosophia. So, and with this, okay, Dr. Gripaldo still, okay, I still consider him okay, as 
the Filipino philosopher at the margins is because there are only few uh, philosophers who recognize his great contribution in our endeavor. So thank you, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Avenes, for your discussion. Palakpakan po natin silang lahat, lahat po ng ating mga speakers sa panel 4. Okay, we move on immediately to the question and answer part. Ayan. So, babasahin ko po ulit ang mga tanong. Ang una po nating tanong ay marami. Sunod-sunod po. Dahil po ka, Sir Jeremiah Joven Joaquin. So, these questions po are para kay Dr. De Hoya, ma'am. Okay, so first, some clarifications. The men in white, for example, Mahu, Encarnacion, Enriquez, Bonifacio, et al. are Pascual's disciples. They dominated UP meetings during their time. Is this why UP disbanded them? Question number one, ma'am. I'll proceed to question number two para po dere -derecho. Pascual also was a big fan of Russell's. He even has a signed letter from Russell. But what's the extent of Russell's influence to him? Still po from Sir uh, Joaquin, number three question. Not sure if Pascual was really influenced by logical positivism per se. He was more of a scientific-oriented philosopher in the mold of Russell. So please comment on that. I'll give the mic to Dr. De Hoya, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. Ma'am, excuse me, ma'am. Your microphone, po. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Ma'am, bro, I was, I was actually just saying, parang pageant show talaga to, ano? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Question number <laughs> one. Question number one. <laughs> yeah. Sige, ma'am. Your turn, po. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So sorry about the, the, the music. Uh, yeah, uh, Sir um, Jeremiah, maraming salamat sa tanong niyo. Uh, these are very difficult questions, uh, especially since the, the scope of my study was really this, uh, the context, no, the socio-political context uh, of, of Ricardo Pascual. And I'm also not uh, from the analytic tradition, so nangangapa ako. It, it's kind of good also that you, but it's good that you asked it because... These are questions that would probably enrich a study of Ricardo Pascual. But I'll try anyway to uh, address the questions as best as I can. The first question, um, yeah, I, I think the reason why they were disbanded, uh, the UP philosophy uh, professors, no, the, the, the department, uh, it was because they were, they were kind of becoming a very powerful uh, voice especially in a, in a place where, you know, you have sectarian forces. Uh, and, and I guess um, Vidal Tana, like I said, was, was a key to, to uh, weakening uh, the, the department. Um, and of course, uh, Father Delaney was, was, a, was a force at, at that time. Um, but see, uh, I think, I think for Dr. Pascual, it was actually very good uh, for, for these uh, disciples of his to, to go to other fields. No? So he did, not, he did not resent that. Um, in the end, you know, we have Cesar Mahul, for example, or uh, Lagmay in psychology. So I think, I think it kind of benefited actually these disciplines. Uh, Nevertheless, you know, I think I think they were threatened, no? uh, especially these sectarian forces of this growing uh, influence of the philosophy department. Um, but, marami pang kwento dyan eh. Kasi like, for example, I spoke with uh, 
uh, uh, Professor Nemenzo recently, uh, a few years ago actually, they, he was telling me to talk to uh, JD Constantino. Uh, unfortunately, when I called her, she she's already she was already then a nun in, at the at the convent for for many years. But at the time I I called her, she was already bedridden. But and and I couldn't talk to her. But uh, I think uh, ne Professor Nemenzo was kind of saying that it might be nice to see the side, the other side of it all. So, hindi lang yung uh, libertarian tradition, but also the, the sectarian uh, forces. No? So, and then the second question, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ma'am Glove, uh, what is Russell's influence on, on Pascual? Is that correct? Okay, I can't hear you, but anyway, so yes, Pascual was a big fan. Okay, he even had a sign. What's the extent of Russell's influence to him? Very good question, but I'm, unfortunately, I don't think I'm capable of answering that now. Um, I do know that uh, Pasquale wrote uh, an article uh, entitled Understanding Mr. Russell, and it was published in 1949 at the Philippine Social Sciences uh, Humanities, uh, uh, Humanities Review. No? Um, so... In that, it is very complicated. I was just like looking through it today. <laughs> Analytic tradition cannot understand. So anyone there who, who is in in that tradition, please, uh, by all means, I, 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 could, I could send you the, that article so that we can together, you know, see how far it got, no, the the, the influence. But I think, you know, if, if you look at... Uh, the idea of uh, how uh, Bertrand Russell influenced logical positivism, and how you know the the primary idea behind it is is the, the importance of empirical evidence. You know, that only empirically verifiable things are are you know are important. And they try to do away with traditional metaphysical doctrines. You no, know? well, you can see how. You know this verification principle that logical positivists were were into. Uh, you can see that actually in Ricardo Pascual's uh, book, you know, uh, when, when he tries to uh, uh, you know try to analyze the the document, the the, the, the claim that Rizal retracted you know, uh, his anti-Catholic sentiments. So I think I think if you if you look through if if you want to to uh, try to understand this further, I think it would be nice not only to read up on what he thinks of Russell, but how he actually applied uh, the the tool um, in his investigation in in, in his uh, explanation of of why of why the retraction of Rizal is kind of like, you know, <laughs> so I think that's it. Did I miss anything? Uh, okay. Number three, Paul. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> okay. How so another question, Paul. Andrea Jessica de la Pena from UST, still for Dr. De Hoyman. How would you, how would Ricardo Pascual in scientific communication and philosophical dialogue thriving in the Philippines. Yes, ma'am. Go, Paul. Kung pageant po, talagang natalo na ako. I don't know how to... <laughs> I, do, I really don't know how to answer that question. Um, but uh, definitely... Um, if, if, you, if you want to pursue that question, I guess... One could could see how uh, Pascual was was very much into uh, Rizal, and he believed that you know that that um, that an understanding of Rizal's work uh, should be uh, one of the primary inquiries, no philosophical inquiry. So I think I think he would um, encourage no philosophical discussion. Uh, on that, on that, um, on that level. 
So, but scientific discourse, well, he, he was a logical positivist. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> at this point, I'm, I'm really grappling for answers. I really don't know. So I'm going to, you know, uh, keep it at that. Uh, but thank you for your question. I'll, I'll ponder on that. Thank you. Salamat, ma'am. Sabi ni Doc Job Aguas, panalo ka pa rin daw pag Miss Universe po. <laughs> okay, next question po from Bodega Studios. This is for Dr. Mahagwai, sir. From Alex from CBSU. Sa, pa sa pa paanong pamamaraan magiging ganap na instrumento ang kritikal na pag-iisip o pananaw sa pag Papakatao ng isang Pilipino kung ang akademiya ay laging laging karugtong sa tanong. Hinahanap ang katumpakan sa lahat ng bagay. Ayun po, sir. Sa'yo na po ang mic. Uh, salamat, Sir Alex. Uh, yung unang part ng tanong ay uh... Napakaganda ng unang part. Yun lang panghuli, medyo kinakabahan ako dun sa ang akademi ay hinahanap yung katumpakan sa lahat ng bagay. Uh, iiwanan ko muna yun, sasagutin ko yung una. Yun. Uh, ilagay natin sa konteksto na ganito. Uh, ang, ang kagandahan ng filosofiya ng edukasyon, uh, gamit yung framework ng uh, critical thinking, uh, ito yung mas malapit sa buhay ng mga tao at sa filosofiya. Parang ito yung dugtungan eh. Ngayon, paano makakatulong yung filosofiya ng edukasyon, lalo na sa akademiya? Ang pinakang konkreto at napakagandang tingnan natin at pwede nating sundan talaga ngayon ay yung movement ni na Dr. Sosimo Lee ng University of the Philippines, yung Philosophy for Children. Yun yung nakikita kong isa sa napakagandang movement na maaaring makatulong sa atin. Alam ko, mayroon ding movement na ganyan si na Dr. Roda Benes sa PNU. Kasi nakikita ko hindi... Itong, itong pagpapahalaga gamit yung critical na pananaw, hindi ito parang cultural revolution na instant, na parang, parang people power. Walang ganon, kundi ito ay uh, magsisimula talaga ito sa baba, magsisimula sa mga bata. Kaya malaki ang may tutulong natin, lalo na yung mga guro. Tayo, lalo na nagtuturo tayo sa, ako halimbawa sa College of Education, ito yung tinatanim ko na bigyan ng pagkakataon yung mga batang magtanong. So, yun lang. Sana ay nasagot kita, sir. Salamat, Sir Jerwin. Susunod na tanong po para pa din sa'yo, Sir Jerwin. From Richard Suriao, yes. So, in Emerita Quito's critical na pananaw, ano po ang masasabi niya dito sa pilisopia ni Giorgio Agamben na Three Methods of Learning? from Our Lady of La Salette College Seminary. Mabuhay, sir. Ayan, so uh, nararamdaman kong seminarista yon, Kasi nakaamoy eh, pagka pa seminarista nakaamoy yan eh. So, uh, galing din ako dyan. Pero, brother, uh, may kababaan loob kong sinasabi na hindi ko naaral si Professor Agambin. So sa pag-aaral ko kay Merita kito ang binalikan ko lang ay sina Paulo Freire kasi yun yung mas may mas may pag-aaral tungkol sa uh, critical thinking, critical pedagogy in education. Pero wag kang magalala kung may pagkakataon ay magugdayan na lang tayo at uh, tayo ang gagawa niyan paano natin sila pagsasamahin. Ayan. Yun lang po ma. Okay, maraming salamat po sir. Susunod pong tanong. Ayan. From 30 Dalisay, Ricky from UST. Doc Mahagwai, sayo pa rin po ito. Do you think that our current educational system, teacher superiority equals students inferiority, is one factor that restrains students' children from thinking critically? Sir. Thank you, sir. Uh... Si Sir, nararamdaman ko na ang binabasa niya na yung Pedagogy of the Oppress ni Paulo Freire. Kaya ganun yung tanong niya. Uh, ang, 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 ang background niyan ay yung banking concept of education. Na talagang may, may oppressive yung mga teacher na parang sila lang yung may alam na 
nagdi-deposit lang sa mga estudyante pagdating ng exam kung ano yung matanda ng estudyante, yun lang yung learning. Totoo yun sir, tama yun, may kinalaman yung mga teacher. Kaya nga ang pinakamahalaga, magkaroon ng dialogue. Hayangan nating magtanong yung mga estudyante. Kasi sa totoo lang, sa pag-observe ko, sa, lalo na pag may mga teaching demonstration sa College of Education, uh, minsan napaka-superior ng teacher. Pero dapat ay uh, bigyan natin ng pagkakataong magtanong ang mga estudyante. Kasi malaki ang dating nun sa kanila at sa kanilang paligid. So, thank you, sir. Okay, maraming uh, salamat, Lowe. sir, sa sagot. Yes, Lo. Gusto ko lang... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yung, 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 kasi medyo interesting kasi yun. Because kasi kami dalawa ni Sir Jerwin ay interesado kami sa uh, filosofiya ng edukasyon. Pero ang tinitingnan ko kasi ay yung philosopher's pedagogy. Uh, so, yun, maganda kasi itong tingnan dahil na-challenge din yung pedagogiya nating mga filosofo, lalo na sa old normal. But, pero sa analysis ko kasi, meron kasi tayong tinatawag na ano eh, okay? uh, I don't know kung paano yung tracing. Ano? Meron tayo kasi talamak kasi sa, sa philosopher's pedagogy, yung traditional, yung tinatawag nating pedagogy of fear. So, yung F ay parang takot ang estudyante mo, naranasan ko yun. No? Talagang grabe yung mga professor namin kung magmura, kung, kung sabihan ka ng kung ano-ano. Talamak yan sa filosofiya na hinahamak ng iyong pagkatao. Pero sa kanila, sa atin kasi hiwala yung hiwala yung pagkaguro nila okay, sa kanilang pagkatao. Pero talaga sa classroom, nakakababa talaga yun talaga sa sarili. Pero hinihiwalay natin kasi tanggap natin mga, lalo mga examinarian kami, mga formators kasi sila. And then pangalawa, yung tinatawag na pedagogy of arrogance. Matindi yan, nawawala na yung, yung humility, yung Socratic humility. So talamak yan sa, sa filosofiya na talagang kailangan din natin i-address na tingin ko ay nagiging issues ng exclusivity ng filosofiya at yung pangal yung yung kasunod na na e yung exclusive kasi yung fear f fear e is exclusivity a is arrogance then repressive so dito natin nakikita rin ito sa sa mga ano natin mga oral exam sa philosophy courses pag nag oral exam labas pag hindi nakasagot so yung tipong mga ganun ano so Sir? Sir Rod? Ayan. Napakaganda ng uh, sagot ni Sir Rod. May fear siya. Sir? Going back? Okay, moving on po tayo. Kasi may technical problem po kay Sir Rod. So, Susunod po na tanong, papunta po ulit kay Sir Jerwin Mahagway. Sir, first from San Carlari College, the question is, how can we appreciate the word pagpapahalaga today knowing that most youths are now reliable to technology? Ah, yan po yung tanong ni Ms. Fares or Mr. Fares. Sir? Ayan, ah... Uh... Eksaminarya na naman, talagang uh, nararamdaman ko na ang inyong spiritual na kapangyarihan. Uh, pero magand may magandang idea, no? pwede niyong gawin term paper. Yung, yung idea ng uh, isa sa mga nakikita ko, yung magkakasama na kayo sa bahay, pero magkakalapit na kayo pero magkakalayo kasi lahat nakatingin sa cellphone. So para bang napakalapit pero napakalayo. So para bang ang idea ay... Uh, Disconnect to connect. You, you disconnect sa internet para mawala, para magkaroon ng uh, panahon na magkwentuhan. Uh, but in principle, pag, pag inaral naman yung critical thinking, hindi masama yung isang bagay, hindi masama yung technology, hindi masama yung gadget. Ang tanong lang ay turuan natin kung paano gagamitin. Halimbawa, nakikita natin ang dami ng mga kabataan yung nagbablog. Ang tanong ay, ano ang content ng blog? So, nakikita ko minsan, nagmumurahan lang. Nakikita ko minsan ay uh, may mga sexy lang yung pinapakita. So, ang, ang critical, pedag critical thinking, turuan natin sila ng ma magandang pwedeng ilagay na makakatulong. Huwag nating alisin kasi nandyan na yan. So, i-guide lang natin ng maayos. At responsibilidad natin yon bilang mga social thinkers. 
mga educators. Salamat, ma'am. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir Jerwin. Now, ayan, may uh, papasasalamat kay Sir Rods. Thanks, Rods, sabi ni Sir Jeremiah to Ben Joaquin. And just a clarification about my critique of Dr. Grips. My point was his national approach was a bit circular. A Filipino philosopher is a philosopher who is a Filipino citizen. Comment, sir. Uh, okay. Sir Rod? Uh, I think medyo siguro din ano lang ako yung maganda maitama din ako ni uh, Sir JJ dito. Pero based on sa readings ko kasi dalawa yung criticism. So that is the first one. And the second one is the internal inc inconsistencies of uh, Dr. Gripaldo. So with with the first one on the national national approach, uh, that is his method, particularly in the consideration of uh, the critical bibliography. Okay, and I I I really appreciate the the critique of uh, Dr. JJ on that. So, but with the first the the second approach, particularly the internal consistencies, uh, I think uh, yeah there may be an internal consistencies with the method that has been done by. Dr. Gripaldo. But we need to take into consideration, particularly, bumalik din tayo sa cultural milieu nung panahon niya. Nung mga panahon na yan, kami dito kasi sa PNUSL, may tinatawag kami yung pagahawan. At we, we call them trail, trailblazers, mga tagahawan. At sa, sa kultura ng linang, napakabigat maghawan. Yan yung pinakamahirap na magtrabaho dahil sobrang laki ng talahib, napakadilim, napakaraming tuod. Hindi mo alam kung, gaan, kung ano yung susuungin mo. At ang and dami mong tatabasan, talagang naranasan ko na magtaba sa dinang, talagang magkakalyuhin ka talaga. So alam niya ni, ni, ni Sir Jerwin dahil uh, naranasan niya yan sa pagiging saknungan sa Mindoro. So ganun yung ginagawa namin ano, ng mga tagalinang. Pero ang paghahawan, habang ito, mag, ang ginawa sa atin ng mga to, naghawan sila. Okay, kahit na merong mali sa kanilang paghahawan, Pero tayo ngayon, bilang mga, mga sunod-sunod na henerasyon, ang task natin, maglagay ng muhon. Ibig sabihin nun, maglagay na ng boundaries. Ito na yung boundary ng, ito na yung boundary ng pamimilosopiya na, na ginagawa natin. Ah, Na-appreciate ko, tama yung, yung maganda yung kritisismo ni, ni Sir JJ. Napakaganda ng kritisism uh, ni Dr. Uh, ni Dr. Uh, Knapp. Napakaganda because tinitingnan dito yung aspeto ng tinatawag na foundational issues of Filipino philosophy. At, at very thankful ako sa, sa, dalawang, sa dalawang scholar na to. It's because inilagay nyo sa next level yung pamimilosopiya sa Filipino philosophy. Particularly questioning okay, the, 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 the context of family resemblances that has been used by Dr. Gripaldo and any other among our, our philosophy. Pero dapat nating tandaan na sila ay naghawan. Ano? At ang atin ngayon ay tayo ang maglagay ng muhon. And then sa paglalagay natin ng muhon na to na-identify na natin kung ang, ano ang ating kaligiran at kung saan tayo, dito sa amin sa PNUSL, dito kami maglulukad. So yun yung, yun yung aming partisipasyon. Okay, maraming salamat Sir Rod. Sir Rod, nawala ka po kanina sa discussion nyo dun sa fear. Napakaganda po. Gusto nyo po bang ituloy? <laughs> ah, ah, okay po. Ah, Nagtapos po kayo sa letter R. Okay, sir. Okay, so, Pwede po. Sige po. Yes, uh, yun yung tinatawag na talagang talamak sa pamimilosopiya natin. Uh, may, medyo nakahaway. Naka Lahat kasi tayo dumaan sa ganyang, sa ganyang karanasan. Yung mga seminarista, makakarelate dyan. Ano? So, kami ay mga ex-seminarians, ganyan din yung naranasan namin. Pero, medyo developing pa yung pag-aaral ko ng pinaguhiya ng mga philosophers nato kasi napapansin ko din yung patriarchal na pedagogiya lalo na sa oral exams. Okay, uh, talagang napaka-patriarchal talaga yan. Uh, papasok ka sa sa isang napaka-confined na na kwarto pero ang 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 ano kasi noon, ang history noon, confessional box yun. Doon ka nag doon ka nag hindi ko na ma-distinguish sa sarili ko kung ako ba ay nag-oral exam or nagko-confession. Uh, yun yung ano eh. So, na nag-originate Kahit nga pag ano ko sa Ateneo, may makikita ka na maliliit na boxes doon na doon nag, uh, nagkakaroon ng mga oral exams. Sabi ko, nakikita ko na ganitong ganito eh. Ang, ang Ateneo hindi pa naka, nakaalis doon sa ganung klase ng uri ng, ng, ng pedagogy. Pero ngayong nagkaroon ng new normal education, na-challenge. Ano, at meron na tayong tinatawag na okay, yung, yung pedagogy of care, being critical, being caring to our students, 
and something na parang it makes us something na the, the, the understanding na kailangan maging relevant uli yung philosophy. Talagang challenge yan sa atin ngayon at hinamon tayo ng pandemyang ito. Kung paano ba ang pagtuturo, for example, ng etika, ito ba ay ano. So, gusto na nating tanggalin itong F na to. Gusto na nating tanggalin yung fear. Gusto na nating tanggalin yung pagiging exclusivity. Gusto na nating maging inclusive. Gusto na nating tanggalin yung kayabangan ng, ng pamimilosopiya. Kasi gusto na nating ugatin ito sa personal na karanasan ng ating mga estudyante. At tingin ko, ay, uh, ito ay medyo matagal pang ginagawa kong pagsusuri ano, at magandang pag-usapan. Yan, maraming salamat po, Sir Rod. May katanungan po ulit. Ay, ang tanong po ay kay Dr. Derwin from JB Kahiko, St. Augustine Seminary. Ayan po. Sa iyong palagay, Dr. Derwin, paano ling mapapanumbalik ang pagpapahalaga sa ikon? Kayo ang ating mga kababaan ay masyado ng lulong sa makabagong teknolohiya. Ayan, sagot niyo po, Sir. Ah, salamat JB ano. Ah, natutuwa ako kasi St. Augustine Seminary, siguradong sa Kalapan City 'yan. Diyan ako graduate. Ayun. Kaya nararamdaman ko na habang nanonood ngayon yung si JB, may mga kasama pa yan at nagtatawanan niya mga yan. Uh, JB, nararamdaman kong pwede na yung uh, cellphone sa seminaryo ano. Nung panahon namin ay uh, bawal na bawal yan at uh, pag nahuli ka, labas ka. So, tanggal yung pangarap mong maging pari at tanggal yung pangarap mong makatapos ng pag-aaral. Uh, pero sa ngayon, sa aking palagay, uh, gusto ko pa rin balikan yung sinabi ko kanina na hindi masama ang teknolohiya. Para mang, parang usapin lang ng pera, hindi masama ang pera. Naka, naka, nandun, yung, nandun kung paano natin gagamitin. Kaya nga bilang mga nag-aaral ng filosofiya, lalo na bilang guro, Uh, ang ang itanim natin ay gamitin ng maayos ang teknolohiya para makat, makatulong or makapagpabago ng pagpapahalaga. Kaya nga halimbawa, natutuwa ako ngayon lalo na sa Mindoro, may usapin kami ng Mina, uh, ginagamit ng mga pari yung uh, ginagamit ng ilang mga pari, ilang seminarista yung vlog para ipakita yung kagandahan ng Mindoro. Yun yung mga kagandahan na pwede natin gamitin ng teknolohiya. So nasa atin yan ngayon kung paano natin mapapaganda at uh, magagamit para makatulong sa atin ang teknolohiya. So maraming salamat. Okay, maraming salamat po Sir Darwin. Now unfortunately po, we want to entertain all your questions but we are limited by time. So last two questions na lang po tayo. Okay, ito po ay para kay Dr. Abenes from Harvey Parinas. Oh, Dr. Avenes, and to all other speakers po, sa lahat daw po pala ito. So, um, to Dr. Avenes and to all other speakers who could articulate that I encountered one particular comment regarding philosophical endeavors in the Philippines is that it all it's all money-making, which is an, which is a, which is a very insult to all philosophical organizations in the country. What are your thoughts and how could we address this? Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone could start, Po? Maybe from, yes, yes, Po, Ma'am Precious. Yes, Ma'am. Excuse me ulit, ma'am. Ma'am, excuse me po. Dr. De Hoya, ma'am. Ma'am, we can have you po. Ayan. Yes, ma'am. Okay na po. Nakamute na naman kanina. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering, yung question, ang pinupunto niya ay ang filosofia ay naging money-making. Ganun ba? Making. Hmm. Tingin ko, actually, walang pera. <laughs> Walang pera sa, <laughs> hindi ko alam kung, uh, ewan ko kung saan siya nanggagaling, pero uh, tingin ko yung, yung, yung problema nga sa, at, at I think ito, uh, Dr. Rod, uh, 
Diba ito'y galing rin kay, uh, kay ay, uh, uh, Sir Jerwin, sorry, kay, kay, ano ata, kay uh, Emerita Quito. Diba yung kanyang uh, analysis ng problema sa filosofiya na isa sa mga problema nga na uh, walang pera. So I don't know if you, you could comment more on that. Sir Jerwin. Uh, sige. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, De ma'am De Hoya, no? Uh, siguro ang pinanggagalingan ni Sir ay yung mga... Minsan kasi nagkaroon ako ng reflection dati na marami sa atin yung nagsusulat ng mga articles para mapublish sa international. And then parang tayo-tayo din lang yung nag nagkikritik sa isa't isa. So hindi na natin tinitingnan yung isyong panlipunan kasi pag napublish yung paper natin, tataas yung sweldo natin, tataas yung rank natin. Pwede ganon pwede rin naman na nagsusulat lang ng libro para ibenta, so naging pera yung filosofiya. Pero gusto kong tingnan na ganito, sir. Dati ang perspective ko ay uh, matataas yung halimbawa, nasa Lasal, nasa Ateneo, taga UP, matataas sila, kaya hindi makuha ang speaker kasi malaki ang bayad. Ngayon, gusto kong sabihin sa inyo na sa experience ko, ano, sinasabi ko rin sa mga estudyante ko na kapag may seminar kayo, sulatan nyo yung mga taga UP sa philosophy department. Sulatan nyo yung mga taga Ateneo, taga UST. Tagalasal, kasi mawabait yung mga yan. At pwede nga lang yung mga yan, pagkapihin mo lang at kwentuhan, okay na yung mga yan. Kaya, kesa isipin nyo na matataas yung bayad, naku, hindi. Uh, baguhin nyo yung perspective nyo ngayon, pag nakita nyo yung mga pangalan ng mga yan, hanapin nyo sa Facebook, i-message nyo, makipag-coordinate kayo at uh, wag nyo isipin yung bayad. Sabihin nyo agad na, bawa, Doc Rod, uh, kapi-kapi lang, kaping barako, okay na. Ayan. So, payag yung mga yan, si Ma'am De Hoya, So, sina Dr. Agua sa UST, Dr. Nap, Dr. JJ Salasal, sila, Dr. Lee sa UP. So, napaka-babait at napaka-humble ng mga tao na to. Minsan, tayo kasi na malayo yung naglalayo sa atin. So, tayo, siguro magkaroon tayo ng courage na mag-connect. Kasi nararamdaman ko minsan, baka ganun yung pinanggagalingan mo, sana ay ganun. Kung hindi naman ay si Sir Rod na lang yung bahalang magdagdag. So, salamat Sir. <laughs> okay. Okay, Sir, before pong sumagot si Sir Rod, Clarification po, baka po ang pinupunto ng money making ay yung philosophical organizations daw po pala. So, naging money making na ang mga organizations sa philosophy. Ano pong sa inyo doon, sir? Okay. Sir Rod uh, naman. Si Harvey kasi ay kilala ko ng personal. Na-meet ko siya sa mga mga ating activity sa PNPRS. So, naging active din siya uh, and... Uh, Parang ilang beses na rin, ilang beses na rin sa, sa mga webinars natin. At tingin ko yung pinaguhugutan niya ay based dun sa naging comment dun sa uh, pinost ko dun sa aklata ni Tasho. So kung saan merong isang nag-comment na yung activity na lang doon, pera-pera lang, parang ganun. So na ang ginawa ko ay pag pinost ko, sabi ko, this person really makes me smile. Tapos marami mga nag-comment at, at sabi, asa ng pera and etc. Pero kung ang tanong dito, yung pera sa filosofiya, balikan lang natin si Tales. Sumagot na dyan si Tales eh. Yung may pera ba sa filosofiya? So, nasagot na yan ni Tales. Ano? Pero that is not the point. So, yun yung, yun yung sinabi niya. Pero with regards to other uh, organization, yes, we know naman that there are organizations na talagang money making. Napakarami niyan. Uh, pero dito natin makikita, dito sa, sa, sa Pilipinas, ang mga philosophy organizations halos wala wala eh halos talagang laging non-profit organization for example ang 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 PAP halos wala na ring halos kitain ang kami PNPRS talagang talagang wala talagang naka ano lang din kami sa uh, yung yung may membership pero hindi talaga enough so kung mapapansin natin talagang wala 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 tayong makukuhang uh, uh, pera sa sa pamimilosopiya kasi hindi ganoon kasi ang ang ano eh ang ano ng research sa atin gaya nga ng nabanggit ni ni Dr. Gripaldo wala tayong tinatawag na uh, institutional support ano into research lalo dito tayo na dito tayo sa third world country unlike in other countries na malalaki yung budget ng ng research and in fact ano uh, maganda yung mga naging vision ni Dr. Gripaldo na magbigay na mga bursary ano sa mga scholars na makakagawa uh, ng mga magagandang uh, research uh, para lang makapagbigay ng support and etc. Pero of course, you need to be a member of uh, PNPRS. Kaya pinopromote ko 'yan, ano. 
uh, na maging miyembro ano uh, dahil this is an organization you need to pay ano particularly a portion of money in an organization okay not for free in order to have this sense of belongingness kasi pag hindi ka na kasi nagbayad ano lalo na sa konferensya na to 800 yung nag-register ang nanonood lang ngayon sa sa atin ay 207 libre na tapos all of us din magtatanong pa sa amin kung may certificate para bang certificate diploma na lang uh, diploma mill na lang kami certificate mill so yun yung yun yung hiningi yun yung nagiging problema kasi ang gusto namin ay mag-engage tayo sa mas malalim na natalakayan okay at magkita-kita ulit tayo pagtapos ng pandemya at napapansin niyo naman ano at yung efforts na ginagawa ng mga philosophical organizations talagang walang walang kinikita talagang ito ay para lang sa pagmamahal ano kay kay Sophia yun <laughs> wow Ay, yun no. Okay, maraming salamat po, Dr. Abenes, at sa lahat po ng ating mga speakers, pati po sa mga matitinding tanong na binigay po natin sa kanila. So, maraming salamat po sa interesting at lively discussion.